Right, on to part five of the engine building course. So I've just picked the uh, cylinder head up today and to illustrate what I mean about cleaning filings from machined parts, just look at this. There's bits of metal that get absolutely everywhere. And that's just what you can see on top. It goes all down to the jackets in here, it goes all down to the oil galleries. If you look through here, you can see there's just tons of metal filings from where the head has been skimmed. So this engine obviously suffered a bit of detonation and the head was damaged and the block was damaged and the piston was damaged. I actually got one of the old pistons out here and you can see how the top's been chewed up. So it's had a nasty life, this engine. And in order to uh, recover this engine, we've had to deck the block and skim the head quite a lot. So one of the bonuses of this video will be able to go into um, look at things like piston protrusion, uh, valve clearances and stuff. This engine will be probably built with standard cams, so I'm not too worried about the valve clearances. But if the owner then decides they want to put some high lift cams in at a later date, well, there might be some problems with that. So, obviously, by removing material from this part and also removing material from the deck surface of the block, we're actually bringing the valves when they are fully extended or even partially extended during the, during the um, cycle close to the piston. Now, the aftermarket pistons do have bigger cutouts and stuff, and you can get more space and clearance between them, but it's going to be a bonus video we can do as part of the series as we get on with this. But for today, we're going to uh, reinstall our crankshaft, and we're going to assemble our pistons and rods, and we're going to test fit the pistons and rods into the block. So this means we're going to be looking at things like the side clearance on the rods, making sure the pins fit the rods properly, making sure that everything goes together nicely. Um, once the pistons are in, we're going to measure the protrusion of the pistons to make sure the pistons aren't sticking out too much, because also with all the skimming, this deck surface has been skimmed and this cylinder head has been skimmed, we need to be careful that the pistons aren't getting too close to the head. So if we take a piston, this outer part of the piston here, it needs to have about a millimeters clearance or so and if we have removed material then we'll be getting even closer and with thermal expansion everything everything gets a bit bigger when it gets hot just because it turns over when it's cold doesn't mean it's got enough clearance when it's warm so we need to see how much our pistons are going to protrude by because we've uh, obviously skimmed our block um, if it's too much we need to get a thicker head gasket so all good things to look at So the first thing we need to do is install our piston and our rod together. And the way the piston and the rod are connected is you have a pin which goes through the piston and it also has a pair of clips like so which sit in little grooves here so you can see that to stop the pin falling out. So the easiest way I find to do it is to install a circle clip on this side Insert your pin into your rod, that's your piston even, and get your rod and gently push through. Now, one thing to note is to make sure you've got the right pins. I've had a set of pistons recently where the pins that came with the pistons were completely wrong. And once we put the clip in this side, you'd push the pin all the way through. And even though it's butt up the clip this side, it stuck out probably like that so the pin was easily you know a centimeter too long so check out what you've got there's normally on the side of the packet of the uh, pistons or on the data sheet there'll be a uh, something that tells you about the length uh, and the width and also the thickness of the pin material now, so just make sure you've got the right pins also make sure you've got two clips for each piston try not to lose them because that will ruin your day um, when you're putting them in they do have a habit of being a bit tricky and like to spring off across the room somewhere so try and uh, be careful when you do it do somewhere open and clear so if you do drop them you're going to find them or at least keep, keep your, your hand cupped over it and just try and catch it um, so looking at our pistons pistons are directional now you need to look at your pistons uh, data sheet to know exactly what they've got Sometimes you get a mark on the exhaust side, 
Sometimes you get a mark on the inlet side. Sometimes you get a mark pointing towards the cam belt or the timing chain. So don't just assume because you've got a mark here that it's always going to be the exhaust side or always going to be the inlet side. You need to check out your specific pistons. Now, I've never found a concrete answer to the next thing, which is which way around does the rod go? These rods are symmetrical, so you can't put them, you can't cause a problem by putting them all around as such. When you're doing like V engines that have got two rods per journal, they have a surface that the two rods connect in. So if you've got a V8, for example, you might have two rods like that on the same journal, they'll have a face that face each other. So there are some specific things to look at for that. But on four cylinder engines, they seem symmetrical. Now, one thing is to do with the notches. Is there a reason they should go on the inlet side or the exhaust side? And I've never really found an answer to that. So engines I've pulled apart from the people who've had pistons, the rods this way, and the engines this way. I've even had engines where they've been some rods that way, some rods that way. So I'm not sure the exact answer. So what I've always done over the years is just copied whatever the OEM rod was doing. So this is the inlet side. There's the little dimples, there's the little dimples in there. That's the way around, which means we're going to have this facing towards the exhaust and PEC facing towards the inlet. So yeah, never found an answer to that one. So I've got our first circlip in. What I like to do is put the pin in and just have put the pin up against where the circlip would be. It just gives you a surface to push against and keep your finger in the other side, for example. Otherwise, when you're trying to put these clips in, what happens is they tend to go inside and funny angles like that, and you just can't quite get a, get them in very easily. Um, once the first clip's in, you need to pull your pin back out, so it's like so. Now, keep an eye on this, because you can see I've turned the piston around in my hand. So just need to keep an eye on that this is the exhaust side, it's got the arrow pointing towards the exhaust, and also that the larger cutouts for valves are on the inlet side. So with our rod, we said the PEC, or in this case, the little notches here, we're gonna to go to the inlet side. So we wanna put our rod in that way around. So it's a bit hard to do it on camera, I'm trying to hold it at a funny angle. So we just need to gently line our pin up and our rod up, and it'll go through like that and butt up against the first circuit. Once we're in like that, we can insert our second clip. So once our pin's through, we just need to install our second clip to retain the pin. And once the both pin um, pin clips are in, the pin should pretty much be solid in there. You should be able to feel it wobbling around. Just make sure that it's in all the way around. Keep a good eye on it, make sure it's not like half gonna fall out. Make sure it's definitely in the, in the groove all the way around. The next thing to look at is just be aware of how much side to side movement you've got here. Now, there needs to be a bit because your bores and your crank may not be perfectly aligned, which means you might get a rod that sits slightly to one side in a cylinder. But we want to be sure we haven't got too much movement um, or misalignment to the bores from the crank, because if your rod's butted up against your piston, those surfaces are going to rub together when your engine's running, it's going to wear. So the rod might sit there, it might sit there, but really you want to be sure when the engine's put together, we keep an eye on these two surfaces here, make sure they're not touching on one side. If there is a problem with that, then you need to get a different set of rods or a different set of pistons because they're not going to make together very well. I remember years ago seeing a uh, set of pistons for a Corsa and the normal rods people use for the Corsa weren't, weren't installed. The piston was just thicker and a thinner area here for the rod to go in. And when the engine was assembled, it was literally rubbing up against the side there. So one thing to keep an eye on. So now I've done that piston and that rod together, I'm just going to do the rest of them, put them all together. So this is the second I'm putting together. And this is what I mean, you just need to make sure that when you're putting these pins in, that you keep an eye on them, they're not sort of stuck out or that they're definitely not hanging off the edge here and they've missed their gap. So just make sure you keep an eye on them, make sure that clip is definitely put in all the way around in that groove. The last thing you want to do is see is one of these pins falling out when, you, when your engine's running, because that'll make a horrible mess. So just keep an eye on it. Another thing to note that I think about as well is that you're trying to make sure that the piston feels like it's moving smoothly on the uh, rod and on the pin. You want to make sure that there's no real up and down movement or side to side. If you can twist the rod, for example, that would show a sign of that there's a size difference between your rod and your pin. That could be a problem. You want, to, you want it to be sort of firm so it can't move up and down and then it can't pull in and out or twist or whatever. But at the same time, the piston's free moving. It rocks pretty freely. So you can see it just sort of flops 
nice and smoothly. Just a bit more information on how the circlips go in. You insert the circlip into half the groove here, just put the end in. You notice I've also got the pin in to help stop it from rotating, swinging around, make sure I actually get it into the groove. And what you do is you get a small little screwdriver, lift it underneath the circlip into this little recess gap here, and you're just looking to bend it over so the circlip pops down. And then just use your finger or a tool, whatever you need to do, just to hear that little click. And then just inspect all round to make sure that that circlip is in the groove all the way around. You can see the pin now can't push out the other side. So that's that one in. And unlike that last one, which is nice and easy, this one here decided to ping out across the room. So again, watch out for these going flying. They can do it. So once we've got all four rods and pistons assembled, just give them a good going over to make sure we've got all of our little notches the same way around where they should be. Make sure the pistons are all the same way around. So the big valve cutouts are on the same side. Just go over all the pistons and rods. Just make sure you check your clips again. Just make sure you check the play in the rods and the, on the little end. Just make sure you've gone over it all and you're happy with it. Everything feels normal and everything's put together right around before we move on to the piston rings. Right, so now we're happy with all our pistons and rods. It's time to fit our piston rings. Now, go back to your data sheet and you will find that there should be a diagram of the orientation of the rings, how to identify which ring is which, and also the way to tell which way is the top of the ring and the bottom of the ring. So if you remember from our piston ring gapping video, we identified this is the first ring, this is the second ring, so, sorry, what we're doing, that's the second ring, and these are the oil control rings. So this is your oil scraper and then two retaining rings for the oil scraper. Remember that the rings do have an orientation up and down, so in this case we've got little markings, but we can also tell from the angle and the grooves on the side of the rings by looking at the diagram here. This is a test assembly, so I'm not too worried about the ring orientation. It's all going to come apart again anyway. So I'm not going to install the rings and too, be too worried about it. They do move anyway. But what you're trying to look for is that, generally speaking, that the gaps between the rings are either 180 degrees apart or 120 degrees apart or whatever your recommended installation is. Now the reason for this is that if you've got two rings aligned like so, gas can come straight down past one ring, straight past the second ring, and into your sump. So you've got a lot of blow by. If, however, the rings are orientated completely the opposite way around, gas has to come down past the first ring land, go all the way around the piston to get down the second one, to go all the way around to the, to perhaps the third one, and so on. You're creating a longer time for the, prop, uh, the gas to propagate from the top of the combustion chamber into your crankcase. Now, by delaying the, um, the gas, effectively, you are creating the better seal. Because by the time the gas has got half around, the piston's probably going to come back down again, or it's next stroke, and it doesn't matter anymore. The pressure's gone. Whereas, if all the rings are lined up, in a split second, all that pressure can go straight through down to your crankcase. So when it comes to ring ordering, um, generally it's easiest to put the scraper on first. This scraper actually has a little wire through the middle of it, so it doesn't actually open all the way up. And so the scraper just goes on over the top, and you open it up, and it goes into the big groove here at the bottom. Keep an eye on where that gap is, it's up here, and the, the recommended position for the oil expander is about, about over here. So you want to rotate your ring, there's the gap, find your gap round to the position, it's a bit hard to see, there it is. Now these are going to move around a bit while you're holding it, it's just trying to set them up so they're roughly in the right position before the final installation rather than having to spend ages going round and round and round trying to look for them. Next is the lower uh, oil retaining ring and the diagram it recommends it goes this way. So again you just want to gently put your ring over. Don't just try and go straight for the bottom of the piston. Step it down bit by bit. So you open the ring up and you go down a bit at a time. Otherwise, what happens is you bend the ring too much and you break it. So again, just trying to hook the ring round and make sure it goes into the bottom groove. Again, putting the gap approximately in the location where it's supposed to end up. The upper oil ring 
Here we go. Get my fingers on it. This one goes over here, which is 180 degrees away from the ring below it. So again, I'm just going to walk the ring down step by step. It's just a bit hard to hold it this way, so I'll make it so you can see on the camera. I'd normally probably hold it much over such to me. I'm just going to step it into the, the correct brew. It's got caught in the second ring, there you go. Keep your finger on it and start to walk it down. There we go. So what we've got now is our oil control rings installed and they're of an approximate orientation. Next we've got is our second ring, which is the darker of the rings on this case. Again, you can tell by what the data sheet says, and also you'll find that the second ring probably fit into both grooves, but loosely into one and tightly into its correct groove. And you also find the top ring generally will not fit into the second ring's groove, so you can't really get this one wrong. Second ring orientates approximately this way, looking for the marking here on to make it on top, which also to do with the shaping of the ring as well, if you can't even got a mark. So again, we're just going to try to put the ring on step by step. These ones are a lot easier to break. And so it's been quite difficult to hold it down here and hold it on camera. It's a bit of a funny angle for me, but there we go. So gently, so this is where you start to put stretch and pressure on the ring because it gets, gets caught into one groove and you actually want it in the other groove and that's where you start stretching it. There we are, that's in this nice groove. Make sure it, it all moves freely. Now turn the top ring over, there's our mark, and the recommended installation place on this ring or top ring is over here. So again, pop ring into one side, just try and hold it in with your thumb or whatever, put that over gently, and clip it in. So all our rings there are now installed. The next thing to look at is see if your data sheet gives you a vertical ring clearance. If you haven't already checked them when you when you were gapping your rings, you can install the ring and you insert a tiny feeler gauge in the gap here to make sure you've got a bit of up and down movement that is greater than the minimum, but not not so tight that the ring um, well, so say not so tight that the ring is uh, going to expand and break the piston. Also, not so loose that it can rattle around too much. So they give you a range here of what the clearance between the rings should be. And you just want to insert your feeder gauges on each of these rings to make sure you've got enough clearance. So another way to install the ring is to use a ring expander tool. You basically insert the ring into the, into the grooves on the tool here. And you gently apply pressure to open the ring up. Now it's very, care it's very careful pressure, very delicate pressure. You don't just want to yank the tool and squish it like, as hard as you would like with a pair of pliers because you'll break the ring. You just want to open it just enough to expand the ring to go over the piston, align yourself at the groove. Once you're at the groove, just let this hilt tool go. Now, some people don't like these because they don't just expand outwards, they also cause twists in the ring as well. Um, so it can be easy to break the ring with them. Some people prefer to just take their time with their fingers and put them on by hand. So there's two ways of doing it. I don't mind ring expander tools as long as you're careful to be very gentle with them. Right, there we are. I've got all our rings installed. They're approximately orientated. You'll have to check them again whenever you go to put them in the engine, but that's that step done. Now, all I'm gonna do is put some bearings in them. Now I've measured up all the bearings um, that came in the pack and looked at our rod sizes and crank sizes that we uh, came up with the other day and I've assigned some bearings for each rod. So what we're going to do is we're going to just install the bearings and then we will plastic gauge them once they're in the engine to double check them. But they should be good to go. So once the bearings are in, install the crank and then we can install the pistons and rods into the engine block. Before we put our bearings on, I just want to talk about the caps and their orientation. So this is a coarser piston and rod from a factory uh, engine. And you can see that the actual Actual caps are broken, not cut. And this is very useful when it comes to aligning the cap to the piston, because you can't put it on the way around and you also can't get the caps mixed up between two different rods. So 
this is a great system for making sure you've matched up the right uh, cap. Now the aftermarket stuff is cut smooth. So in theory, you could accidentally take this cap and put it on that one. That's a bad thing to happen because this circle is cut of these two together. By mixing them up or even just turning this round means this is no longer a true circle. So what we're gonna do now is we're just gonna put some little dots on our rods here. So I have one dot to signify that this is number one and then also number one on the bottom so there's no way I can accidentally mix these caps off because I'm going to probably install two pistons at a time like one and four together and two and three together I want to make sure there's no chance I can accidentally mix these caps up so I'm going to label all the caps with a little dot and the rod with a little dot just to be sure there's no way they can get mixed up you may also find it's a bit difficult to get your rod caps off and that's because they've got little dowels in them normally that hold the uh, the cap aligned so one little trick you can do is to wind your bolts halfway out get a rubber mallet hold the rod by the cap like so and just smack your your bolts while you're hanging the rod in the air and that'll just break the seal and get the rod to fall down make sure you get your bolts halfway in not out completely otherwise your piss is going to hit the floor or whatever so just wind them halfway out give them a tap with the mallet and you should be able to break the caps open and there we are so open up you can just see there's little dowels in here to make the cap fit tightly just by holding the rods bolts halfway in, you can't drop it. It's easy to get it open again. This also works what's in the engine as well. Once that's on the crank, you just loosen your bolts halfway out, and then you can tap your your bolts. And it will push the rod down and crack the uh, cap off, which is very good when using your plastic gauge or getting your rod back out again. So I've already measured our bearings to make sure that they're the size I expect them to be. If you remember how we measured the rods in the previous video. What I've done is I've used my micrometer again just to measure our bearing and taken two bearings that are the right size so once they're installed in this rod they'll shrink the rod down so the clearance between this bearing surface and the crank will be the clearance I want. So a good rule to have while we're doing this is to make sure we only take one cup at a time but to install the bearing we just take the bearing it's got a little bit here to line up and you just press the bearing in. One thing to note as I'm doing this is I'm making sure I wipe everything clean just making sure there's no dirt because like even even rubbing that gently you can already find some dirt on there. So again on the other cut on the side of the cap before I put the bearing in just make sure it's wiped off clean. Get my bearing make sure that's clean on the other side. Popping them in together like so just making sure everything's clean. Popping my cap back on, making sure I uh, line my notches up. I'm putting my bolts back in so I don't lose it and my cap doesn't fall off and get mixed up. So just one at a time. So you might wonder why we put so much emphasis on all this, like measuring and bearing clearances and stuff. This is a, a rod we pulled out of an engine of a customer who came in for a power run. And after a couple of runs, suddenly his engine was dropping 100 horsepower. And turning all the fans off, we could hear a little Dunk, 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 sound from the bottom of the engine off, the fans are turned off. And lo and behold, it's spun a bearing with power on. All this dark, squashed out stuff you see around here used to be a bearing. You can see how the rods turn black from overheating, from all the friction. And that's written that crank off and that wrote off those set of rods at the minimum. And to be honest, when we inspected the rest of the engine because of how the uh, engine ended up, we pretty much replaced the entire engine for the customer. You can see how things can turn pretty nasty. So I don't know if the engine was built to the correct spec or whether there was a problem with the spec or whether the, the oil pump later failed or maybe the oil overheated and had oil, oil cavitation issues because it was just too much power for the uh, oil pump to handle or the oil temperatures to handle, oil cooler, whatever. But um, just thought I'd show you this because things can go can go nasty. Additionally though, for those who don't know as well, these are I-beam rods. This is actually an H-beam rod and you can tell how they are by looking at the shape of the center section and the sides. When you look down it, if you were to cut this in half, it would look like an H. If you were to cut this in half, it would look like an I. So there are two different types of rods you can get. H-beams and I-beams. 
So even though this is a temporary uh, test install to put everything together and test fit it, uh, I'm going to put a bit of engine assembly lube, uh, which is this stuff here, onto the main bearings because when we are installing our rods and test fitting our rods, we will be rotating the crank. And I just want to give it something to uh, to lubricate the bearings and keep the crank protected. I've just wiped down the bearings now, even though this engine sat covered up. We've managed to pull dirt off our bearings, even though they went and clean a couple of days ago. So you need to keep up on top of this. Every time you put your crank in, you need to wipe down your crank, wipe down your bearings, and make sure there's no grit and dirt on there. So now that we're going to be rotating our crank and stuff, we just want to make it sure that it doesn't look like it's binding up and it turns smoothly. When the crank's installed and the caps are all torqued down without any rods, you should be able to easily turn the crank by hand with feeling no sort of resistance or or binding. If you're feeling anything weird, then you need to look deeper into what you've done with your crank installation. Um, but certainly this can just lightly by hand, I can free rotate the crank as much as I want and it's smooth all the way around. So a lot of this next sort of step is just having a bit of a feel for the engine as well, making sure it feels nice and smooth, that nothing feels like it's binding up or that there's a problem somewhere. So I've just popped the crank back out and I've reinstalled it again, but this time I put the oil squirter jets in at the bottom. Now, I didn't originally do this because this was just a test assembly, but I was thinking back to an engine assembly you did on a car. Oh God knows how long ago now. But what was happening was that the oil squirters were catching on the skirts of the pistons. Now, this shouldn't happen on this one, but mistakes happen when you assume things. So how do I know those pistons have been made exactly like the, like the last 20 pistons we've had off people? We don't. So. I've installed them anyway, it can't hurt. Secondly, uh, another bit of tip I was gonna give you as well was that when you're installing a bolt that requires a torque angle rather than a torque setting, um, these bolts you put in, you torque them to a spec and then you continue to turn them by an angle. If you miss a bolt out on your torque wrench, well, you can just go over them again and it will click again and you'll know if you missed a bolt because it won't click and you'll be able to turn it. However, how do you know if you've missed a bolt out when you're doing angles. And one little tip I do is get a tiny little bit of tipex and just tipex the tops of the bolts. And so when you've done your angle, say it's 45 degrees or 90 degrees, after you've done that entire round, in this case, you might want to do a spiral or whatever your particular engine says, you can look down, you can see all the bolts that have moved by the 45 degrees or the 90 degrees or whatever they need to move by. And if you've missed one, it'll be very obvious because the tipex will be in the wrong place. So another little tip for you there, put a little dab of Tipex on your bolts, just on the edge, and you better see them as they've moved around. So before we turn the engine over and install the first and fourth piston, we want to set the crank so that the pistons we're going to install, the crank is at the bottom, or BDC, in this case when the engine's down at the top, so the journals here and here are the ones we're aiming for. Uh, you don't want it the other way up, because otherwise it would make it difficult for you to insert your uh, piston. So we're going to insert number one and number four, and then we'll turn the engine over, couple of times test them and then we'll rotate the engine over again halfway to get these two at the top those at the sorry at the bottom and these at the top as it's the other way up and then we'll insert two and three torque them down rotate a couple of times and as we, as we insert in the pistons just like we did with the crank before we're looking for binding feelings any resistance in turning and so on we're looking for the engine to turn smooth now the rings themselves will add a bit of friction even if you all the boot uh, the the all the bores up you will still get some resistance, but we're looking for a smooth um, feeling on the crank. So you should be able to get a small ratchet, like a 3 8 ratchet, put the main bolt in at the end, and you should be able to sit there with the ratchet and just turn the engine nice and easily. If you've got any resistance or sticking or binding, then stop, strip it apart and do some investigations because something is wrong and you do not want to continue building the engine like that. Now I've turned the engine over, I've given everything a good wipe down. I wiped down the crank and the journals and stuff before we turned it over, and now it's been turned over. I've just gone through all the bores, wiped them out clean, wiped the deck surface, and just try to get rid of as much dirt or grit or dust or anything that could have landed on the engine over the last couple of days away from it. One thing you'll be amazed at is if you wipe down an engine in a workshop and then you leave it for half an hour and you come back with a cloth and go down the bores or something, you'll, you'll suddenly find a bit of dirt in there. You know, you've got to really keep on top of these things before you assemble the engine. I mean, I'm trying to keep things as clean as possible while it's a test assembly, but when it comes to the final assembly, we'll probably spend a day deep cleaning everything. So once you've wiped everything down, we're gonna put a little bit of oil around the bores to help the pistons insert. What we're gonna try and avoid is getting oil on the journals because we're trying to keep the journals dry 
because we want to plastic gauge them once they go in. Once they've been plastic gauged, we're going to put a tiny bit of assembly lube on there again, so we'll better rotate the engine a couple of times though to make sure it's not binding and so on. Um, and then we'll do the other two dry. Then we'll plastic gauge them. Once they've been plastic gauged, put some engine assembly lube on them again, torque them back down again, and just rotate it again and make sure we're happy that everything's turning smoothly. So for 86 mil engines, I have a piston insertion tool which makes this job a lot easier. The tool just acts like a, almost like a cone. You just pop onto the engine and it gradually brings the rings down into the bore rather than having to sort of squish them with this tool. Um, because this is an 86 and a half mil engine, I haven't got that. So again, cleanliness, we need to wipe out our piston ring compressor, wipe down our piston, wipe down everything else, you know, try and keep as much dirt away from this as we're doing it. So these open up by pressing the release here. Once you insert them around your piston, you then use a quarter inch drive uh, ratchet to do them up. So you want to do that a certain way around your piston and then you want to put on the block and level it off, do it all the way up afterwards. So again, making sure our rings are in position. Again, we're not doing a full final assembly here, we're just doing a test assembly. So as long as they're roughly in position, I'm happy. We get our piston ring compressor, we open it up. We pop it around our piston, making sure it's open up to get around our rings. It's not quite open enough, just open a bit more. And then what we want to do is get our quarter inch drive and gently wind the piston ring compressor up around the piston. Don't go all the way yet, we want a bit of adjustment. You'll see how it's not quite gone round and flush. It's fine, just give it a little squish with your hands to try and square it off. You want a bit of the skirt hanging out. And then what you want to do is bring it over to your engine, level it off, and then do it the last little bit up. Take our cap off. Remember to follow the rule, only take one cap off at a time. It bolts out. Pop the bearing down. Give it a quick wipe over, make sure it's all clean. Now pay attention to the orientation of your piston. Just get the piston started in the bore. And what you want to do is a little bit of a tighten first, a couple of clicks, and then get your little rubber mallet and gently just tap your piston ring compressor all around, making sure it's level and flush with the block. Make sure it's definitely as tight as it will go. Again, get yourself as lined as best as possible and so the piston and the rod are the right ways to meet the uh, crank. Now the trick with this is to be gentle, but have momentum. I see a lot of people, they tap it down really, really slowly and gentle. What happens is if you tap it slow and gentle, when the rings get to the bottom of the ring compressor, all they wanna do is pop out and lift your ring compressor up, which is no good. At the same time, you don't wanna smack this really hard because if they do pop out, if you're smacking the piston really hard, you're gonna snap and break a ring. So it's about having a smooth momentum into the bore. If you feel any resistance or the ring's going to pop, stop. Don't push it any harder. So, give it a little bit of a alignment. Make sure we're happy the ring's lined up. And then we're trying to go through one fluid movement through. And there, I heard a resistance. I heard a ring pop out. Stop. And you'll see the oil control ring here has just popped out the ring compressor. So in that case, we just need to release the tension. Push the ring compressor a bit further down. Wind it back on again and reset. Have, have patience with this. Don't, don't get frustrated if it keeps popping out. You will get it eventually. Get it lined up on the bore. Tap our ring compressor all around, make sure we're nice and level. Make sure it's done all the way up. Realign ourselves. Give it a little tap around, make sure it's all flat and flush and try again and again popped out again actually now it hasn't popped out i felt some other resistance there so making sure my crank's in the right place making sure my rotation's correct so have patience again but if you feel any resistance that's not normal stop don't push through it And this is where a larger ring's got stuck. So again, pull out and reset. 
There we go. That's how it went in. And that we do, once it does go in, we just guide the piston down gently, use the handle underneath to get the, uh, the rod, guide it onto the crank. Two rods, number one and before are installed. I've been putting the caps as I go again, one cap off at a time rule, so I can't mix them up. What I'm gonna do now is just give it a little tap on the, uh, on the bolt, and that will drop the piston right down. Same on this one. Never hitting the cap, because if you're gonna plastic gauge it later, you don't wanna get the habit of hitting the cap because you're ruining plastic gauge. Just tap on the bolt and the piston will drop down. And then what we can do is take our, our socket, Undo the bolts on the first one. We can pop the piston back up. And there's our cap. So what we're gonna do is get our plastic gauge, install a small piece across here, torque it down, take it off, and see what our measurement is. Right, so the first plastic gauge is in. Second plastic gauge is going in there. Again, I need to make sure when we put in our caps on that we are making sure that they are wiped down, making sure we align our uh, notches and then I'm going to wind the bolts in and I'm going to talk them to spec. Now remember that these are ARP bolts so not to use the factory uh, rod torque spec, we are using the ARP spec and ensure you've got a super amount of lubricant on the threads for that torque spec and the right type of lubricant because as I alluded to in the earlier videos the ARP spec, the factory spec are all different and the specs are given based on the lubrication on the thread used. If you don't use the right lubrication, then you get a different amount of bolt stretch at the same torque. So it's important that you make sure you've got the right lubricant on it when you do this. So when talking ARP bolts, again, remember that the torque spec may also well be in uh, foot pounds, not Newton meters. And also the bolt material and bolt type may also be listed on the sheet multiple times. So check out which one's actually for you. Um, when talking bolts on a crank and your plastic aging, do not stand this way and wind your torque wrench this way because all that happens is you'll push the crank round. What you want to do is stand this way and make small movements like so, hold your engine stand still, across the crank. And that way the crank will not move as you torque your bolt down. If the, if the crank rotates while you're talking your bolt down or cracking your bolt off, start again, because your plastic gauge will be wrong. And this is one of the reasons why we measure the, all the bearings by hand and we don't just rely on plastic gauge, because all it takes is one little slip and your plastic gauge readings will be wrong. So I'm just gonna torque them all down. Let's settle for a minute and just get my uh, little breaker bar to break them off. When we're cracking off, we wanna be pushing across the crank, so like so. Try and keep it like in a 30 degree window, like 15 degrees away, 15 degrees that way. Try and avoid going much further than that. Um, like as it loosens off, it's easy to go a little bit further, but if you're certainly trying to crack it off, you wanna be just sort of just behind the 19th degree, degree mark and just push across it like that. The tighter the bolt is, the easier it will be to rotate the crank. So just fill the boot bolt, loosen off, as it loosens off more, then you can then you can just turn the bolts easier. And you can see that's nice and loose now. Hit on the bolts and the rod will drop down. Don't hit on the cap. And then you can gently pop your rod back up, which means your cap comes nice and loose. Same again. Hit down on the rod bolt, make sure you're not turning the crank. And then pull the rod underneath up and you cap them nice and loose to get off again. We're going to line up against our mark there and we can see we're bang on the 05, sorry, yeah 050, so 0 0.050. Now given that this is a 50 odd mil journal that's sort of bang on for a performance engine that's one thousandth of the, of the journal diameter clearance. So our measurements we did with our um, micrometers and our bore gauge in the previous episodes, got the right bearings, match the rods, match the pistons, sorry not pistons, match the rods and the crank rather, and match the right bearings, we've got ourselves bang on 
what we want. And we've validated it with the measurements and the plastic gauge, and they both agree. Now, if one disagreed, is it because you've moved your crank and smudged your plastic gauge, or did you do measurements wrong and the plastic gauge is right? So even if you are going to do all the measuring properly, sometimes it's a good idea just to do the plastic gauge afterwards, just to sanity check yourself to make sure you haven't done something silly. That's exactly what we want, though. So we're going to clean off this uh, plastic gauge, put a tab of assembly lube on there, then we'll pop this cap off, because we're going to take one cap off at a time. Check that one, clean it off, it's a bit of assembly loop, and then we'll torque the bolts back down, and then we'll rotate the engine again, just to try to see if there's any weird binding or any resistance in the engine that shouldn't be there, and make sure it turns over nice and smoothly by hand. So both rods are now re-torqued, and they're lubed up. I've turned the engine over a couple of times, and it feels nice and smooth. The only other thing to check now on our test uh, assembly with our rods now is to check the side clearance, make sure we haven't got too much or too little side clearance. That can be done with feeler gauges. Just want to make sure that the rod isn't rubbing too hard on the crank. There's a different little bit of clearance, but also not too much clearance because where the oil is pumped into the bearing, if there's a too much of a gap here, all the oil will just drain straight out and you'll lose oil pressure on that rod. So consult your um, engine specs and make sure your side clearance is good. The other thing is the rod is clear of the side of the pistons down the bottom. You can just see that there's no contact between the rod and the side of the piston. So I'm going to repeat the process for the other two and um, that'll be it for this video. We'll check out the rest of the measurements I was going to do in the next video because it's getting a bit late here now. Um, but yeah, all right, that's it for this part. Um, I'll see you in the next video. Any questions, leave it in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks to everyone who's given the kind messages so far. It's uh, definitely been uh, good to hear that people are enjoying the series. And uh, yes, I will be following this all the way through to the end of the engine. So uh, plenty more videos to come, plenty more to teach. But that's enough for tonight, it's getting late, and uh, I will see you in the next video.